In today's installment of Unpack, I was a straight A student. I was awesome. The only way that we as South Africans really learn is by talking. I want to know what it's like to be part of the real gang. And I asked him to go on his knees and I stood behind him and I shot him. When we started this journey of Unpacked, I wanted to have some very difficult, uncomfortable, but necessary conversations. Some members of our society don't get an opportunity to get their side of the story told. Now today, I decided that I would really like to sit down with somebody who has taken the life of another individual, and he's here with us. Stay tuned. Like many young adolescents, Welcome Vidboy was faced with the challenges and pressures of wanting to belong. Growing up without a father in Valhalla Park in the Cape Flats, he was met with the opportunity to receive the attention and acknowledgement he yearned for, and he took it. A young man with ample potential and some difficult choices to make. This is his story. Let's unpack. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Because your name is welcome. Welcome, Thank Boy. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You know, before you came here and the team and I were discussing what we're going to title the show because it's so easy to put a label on someone based on something they've done. So on the one hand, it's killer, it's murderer. And I kind of settled in my mind that to separate the person from the thing that they did, we would call it, I took a life. I don't know what your thoughts are on that because it's very easy to carry a certain label for your whole life. How do you view what I'm sharing with you? I think for me, the, the, the most important part is um, once you get into the space of where you can talk about what you've done freely and openly, um, the term or the theme Mm -hmm. just, just becomes, I took her life, because that's what actually happened, um, despite the details or despite the nitty gritties of it, but that is actually, in actual fact, what happened. Um, what I'm not comfortable with is being called a murderer. Yeah. You know, um, because if you, if you look at the entire process, murderers aren't, they, they're not planned. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just something that happens, but when you are a killer, it normally comes into a point where everything is planned in a certain way, things need to happen in a certain way. And all of those aspects and dynamics come into play. I find that so interesting. I mean, I think I'm better versed just in terms of the terminology of what's happening in the in the US and the UK, because that's a big part of the content I consume, where um, if you're convicted murderer, you're convicted murderer. Um, so when you separate, is that a legal thing or is that something that you have separated the terminology for yourself to say a killer is a person who went out with the intention to commit that act. Whereas a murderer is somebody who found themselves in a position where they took someone's life. I think for me, it's more of like, if we use medical terms, for instance, yeah. if a doctor gives a wrong prognosis, yeah. it's very difficult to, to help the person deal with whatever the person is currently facing mm -hmm. or going through. So once you, once the system labels you a murderer, it is a label that you can't take because you know that that's not you. Mm. You know, you were part of a system, you were part of a group, you were part of an organized syndicate, and you were sent out with specific instructions to do that. So you know that you are a killer. It's the same with the, with the, with the soldier in the army. Yeah. We don't hear soldiers have murdered people. We hear a soldier went out and they killed yes. because they have an instruction to do so. Yes. And when they say a, a soldier went and murdered, yes. like we got the guy in Alex, for instance, that was murdered by the soldiers because there was no mandate for that man to die. Yes. So it becomes a bit different. So I like to be, I like the, the prognosis to fit me so that I can work through those processes psychologically and get yes. healing through that. So a person that's watching at home might think, wow, I would actually rather be a murderer than be a killer because you knew what you were doing. Mm. How, how do you consolidate that with yourself? I mean, I, I don't even want to speak about you consolidating it like as you and I are sitting because you've done the work, you're comfortable to talk about it. But the first time somebody says you're a killer, I mean, how, do you, how does that sit with you? 
I think in if if I were still part of that place or mm-hmm. in that vicinity or where I was, I, I would be comfortable with being called that. But because I had gone to prison and I'd served my time, I no longer see myself as a killer. I see myself as somebody that, yes, I did take a life. And because I've taken the life, I've also had an opportunity while I was in prison to work on myself yeah. in dealing with those things, even beyond or coming out of prison. So it, it, people do sometimes stigmatize and yeah. discriminate. And because I've worked through my own issues in relation to that, I'm, ki- I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. Do you understand why society probably isn't? I mean, we as a team are probably going to have a lot of people who are saying, how dare you um, even sit and have this conversation? How dare you give this airtime? I, I, I get that that's going to happen, but if it's not going to happen, if we're not going to have this conversation, how are we going to save our young people? How are we going to yeah. save many of the youths out there that want to become like the old welcome? You yeah. know, how are we going to save young people that watch John Wick on television yeah. and want to aspire to be like him? So the only way that we as South Africans really learn is by talking. It's mm-hmm. the same as we faced apartheid. The only yeah. way that we were able to deal with it was by talking about it. And that's just one of the hard conversations that we need to have. Okay, so without even going into the deep-seated background of your upbringing for you to be at the place that you are, and I I want to make it clear that we're not in any way trying to excuse the fact that a life was taken, right? We are engaging to get a better understanding of how a person might find themselves where you were. So can you maybe take us back to your upbringing, you were a good kid, you know, but in a rough neighborhood. So just tell us about, you know, that whole journey. I think for me growing up in, in a community called Vahala Park in the Western Cape, you know, predominantly colored, predominantly gang infested, drug infested. Um, it, was, it was the kind of community where uh, a boy like me had two choices. You either join the gangs or you die on the streets. Mm-hmm. And I had those choices. And what was a boy like me? Because when you say a boy like me, what does that mean? I was exposed to all of those mm. things. I was exposed to the drugs. I was exposed to the violence. I was exposed mm. because it was on every corner in my mm. community. Guys fighting for territory, it was in the corners. Guys fighting for drugs, fighting for, you know, mm. it was always in my space. It was happening. Um, my parents tried very hard to keep me off the streets by putting me into a school that was very far from my neighborhood. Mm. But I needed to go back to my neighborhood. So it was difficult wearing a blazer, being a straight A student, studying, um, and going back into my community and knowing that I'm going to be teased by many of the boys that were standing on the corners, being called a sissy, being called a mummy's boy. Um, Funny enough, because my grandmother used to take me to the bus stop and she used to go and get me at the bus stop Mm. when the bus drops me. So that was that kind of protection that my family um, had and wanted me to have. But it didn't help as I was moving you know, and growing up in that community because every single day I had to fend for myself when my grandmother wasn't there. I had to deal with these guys calling me these names. Mm. And to some extent I envied them because they were respected in my community. Mm. People feared them. People look up to them. And, and to some extent I wanted to be like them. I, I would really love to understand. I mean, we hear these stories often. It's not a unique uh, story of a young man, you know, growing up in a rough neighborhood and succumbing to the environment that he's in. But I, I'm thinking about, you know, when we use the word respect and look up to, how different is that from the simple fear you were explaining to me, which was I had no choice. I either had to join them or to die on the streets. So in hindsight, was that actually respect or for you was that fear? You didn't have a choice. I think for me, I, as I've come to learn growing up and understanding what it actually meant, um, where I was growing up, respect was predominantly tainted with fear. Um, it's either people feared you and in that regard they would respect you. Mm. Um, like I said, the joke I normally make when I talk about my community is no girl looked at me. No girl wanted to go out with me. Because you weren't a bad boy. You know, I was dressed in, a, in my school uniform. I had my blazer on. I was a straight A student. I was awesome. But the girls in my community never looked at me. Mm. But these boys that were standing on corners with their sloppy clothes, with their sloppy language, with their sloppy lingo, mm. girls were crazy about them. 
And for me, it, it, it didn't make sense logically, um, academically, until I actually sat at that table, spoke to those guys and understood that they, they were part of a community that, 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 that lived in that specific environment. And those girls were growing up in that environment. And that is why they could relate to that. They could not relate to me because when I went to Space Bona, which was an Athlon Model mm -hmm. C, it was a different environment and they could not relate to that. So it wasn't about them not relating to me. It was about me mm -hmm. not relating to my own community or my own standards. Hence, that situation happened for me. I mean, one could also possibly say that if you were a kid who didn't care, which was, would have been unlikely, you know, as kids, we want to feel a part of something. If you're a kid who didn't care, um, that, that might not have bothered you, but it bothered you because of what? I think for me, it bothered me because I was starting to think like, I'm gonna grow up in this community. Mm. I was going to be part of this community. And if I'm gonna grow up shielded and protected by my grandmother, always mm. forcing me to go to church, always forcing me to go to Sunday school, by the time she's no longer there, who am I going to have that's going to fend for me? Yeah. My fear was that my grandmother was getting old and she would pass. And if she does, I would not be strong enough mm. to live in this community. I would just die on the streets if push comes to shove. So for me, it was, I either had to start learning, uh, mm. get around. I used to jump over the fence and go to the shop on my own mm. to experience the backlash, to experience the ridicule, to experience the name calling so that I could harden myself in mm. that process. And it was at that moment when I started running away and going to the shop on my own, starting to engage with these boys on my own, mm. did I come to the point of being invited to join them, to become part of the gang. And for me, that was my biggest make, I think. Mm. So then where, I mean, you're speaking so much about grandmother being, you know, the one that you're protected, but you are also feeling a sense of needing to pr protect yourself should she not be there. Where are mom and dad at this point in your life that she is the, the lead of your story at this point? I think for me, I had a very difficult um, relationship with my father. My father was the kind of man that believed in providing mm. and his providing meant not being present, mm. but trying to be somewhere else, creating an empire that one mm. day when he dies, he would hand it over to me. Mm. But for me, it was much more of me looking for him to be a mm. father, to, to teach me soccer, to show me rugby, to do all of these things with me. Hence, until today, I still don't watch rugby. I still don't yeah. watch soccer because I don't know what it is to play those things. There was never that kind of relationship that I had with my father. The relationship I had with my father was more of a subservient one. He speaks, mm. I listen. Mm. You know, he's there when he's available. You know, and when I do something wrong at home, my grandmother would tell him or my mother would mm. tell him. And that would be the only time that he would sit down with me and talk to me. Mm. So for me, it was like the only way I could get his attention was to do more wrong things, break a vase, yeah. you know, uh, do something sinister. And he would sit down and talk to me. And for me, that was our conversation. Yeah. My mom was more of a, uh, a specific strategic woman. You know, she, she, she loved my father and therefore followed his example. Um, she was never really emotionally there. I remember one day when I cut myself um, and, and my mom said to me that, listen here, stop crying, cover that up before your father sees it. Do not display any weakness. And that was the kind of wow. person my mom was. So in a way she was making me hard because she knew of the environment mm -hmm. in which I was growing in. Um, and, and for me, that's, that's where my mother and my father featured. Mm. My grandmother was, was, was everything. Mm. She was the one that understood me, that nursed me, that nurtured me, mm. that spoke in my defense. When my father was too loud or too hard on me, my grandmother, the one that would, you know, um, you know, soften the blows that I would get. So she was that kind of person. Um, but I also knew deep down inside that she's taking everything Mm. that is meant to come to me. And if she would not be there one day, who's going to be there? I had to become mm. stronger than that. Is, uh, is grandmom's mom or dad's mom? Uh, my mother's mother. Okay. So where, where at this stage were dad's parents? Because my father was predominantly, wasn't black, he wasn't colored. It was a very difficult childhood because... What does that mean? Wasn't black, wasn't colored? He was, he, was, he was more of a white person. 
Um, More he was, of or he was, he was, he was white. white. He was and white. He was okay. white, and his family never really, you know, approved the relationship between um, my mother and himself. Mm. So that was the kind of dynamics that we had to deal with. So they were completely removed from us. Mm. It mm. was still in the apartheid years, you know, where it was, you know, moving from you know, community to community to find the right place. Moving from Steenberg, and Steenberg mm. was very much, uh, you know, a place where we could stay, mm. but it later became, are these two people together? Yeah. You know, is your mom working for this guy? What's actually going yeah. on? And then they had to move again, and Vala Park was the best place because nobody judged. Yeah. You know, white people could stay there, black people could stay there, colored people could stay there. Nobody looked and worried about your business. So it's there where we found our place, but that's why the, my father's family wasn't really much of a point. They weren't really in our lives. It's interesting that you say that you found a place where nobody judged, yet it's the same place where you felt the fear that you have to be a part of something or die at the hands of it. It is kind of it is, it's like a conundrum in a way. Because to me, that is judgment. If, if, if that same community... Um, and, and maybe it's not, not judgment. Maybe it's just that's not an agenda we, 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 we care about. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But to me, I'm like the fact that you were judged for being educated and going to a good school, um, that to me makes it seem like a very judgmental area. I think the, the, the I, I get when you say the, the point of judgment. I believe that judgment has various levels. Yeah. Um, for instance, like being educated in Viola Park was a big no-no because the, the entire gang code was written to say that the people that are educated put us here in the first place. So we won't be, be educated. Exactly. So it's because of them that we don't have what we want to have. Um, when we went out to go and rob and steal, we normally went to people that had. Um, when we went into the houses to see the certificates, the diplomas on the walls. So we knew that we were robbing educated people. The guy that was driving Mercedes Benz was an educated person. We knew that we weren't educated. We were not going to get to that point of education. So we had to take from those that were. So if you were modeling and walking around in Vahala Park educated, you were seen as an outcast. And if you wanted to be educated, that dream of being educated would be snubbed quickly. It's almost like you represent everything that they stand against. Exactly. Okay. Now I get it. Now I get it. Okay. So now um, you're being raised in this community. You're the good kid at school. Um, at some point, you are being taunted by your peers in a neighborhood that, I mean, I, I, I always say that I almost lived in a bubble where me and my family were in the township. And then you go to the private school, you know, during, during the week, but you still have to make that far commute and you're back in the township. So it doesn't matter that you had, it was like two different lives. Did mm. you ever feel like you were living two different lives where even maybe... At the Model C school, there were kids who were like, you're not even one of us. I think that that is why even at school, um, I became an overachiever. Mm -hmm. You know, I started really grinding and being in my books. Um, I, I was the, the chairperson of the debating council. Mm -hmm. I was the chairperson of the chess club. I became mm -hmm. the SRC chairperson. I was becoming head of everything yeah. because I felt that I needed to prove myself. Um, and, and, and at the school that I was at, if I wasn't a chair of anything, I would not be seen. Mm. So for me, it was best to overachieve yes. in everything so that I could be accepted there. But to overachieve in all of those areas was a lot of work. Yeah. It was tiring emotionally, physically. Um, but I knew I could only do that for eight hours because that's how long school was. Yeah. But the rest of my day, I had to go home and be somebody else again. And even there, I wanted to fight to be understood, but I knew yeah. that academically I could not make it in my community. Yeah. Um, when the boys were having a discussion about girls, mm -hmm. um, I would bring an academic sense of girls and what it would be like to date them. While they would say, brah, this is shit, you know, what are you yeah. talking about? I would lose them. You know, for them it was, you know, you meet a girl, you, you know, you give her a few slaps and you rape her. You know, that was the kind of conversation. You don't give that woman an opportunity to diss you. You know, you show her power, you show control over. In my head, I was like, but that's not how I would want to do it. Yeah. You know, but in that space, I acted, I pretended to agree. Yeah. You know, I pretended to say, oh, so that's how you do it. So, oh, wow, that's yeah. interesting. You know, I would push a girl here and there because yeah. I didn't want to be ridiculed or joked at. 
But at school, I would be gentle. At yeah. school, I would meet a girl. I would sit down. I would ask her, do you want to have lunch? Do yeah. you want to do this? Do you want to do that? She would be the one saying what she wanted. But at home, I was the one that told her what I wanted. Yeah. So that was the kind of different lives that I was living. What is the first violent act you recall having committed? I mean, you mentioned, I'm assuming at this time you're in your early teens mm-hmm. and um, you're living this sort of dual life which in my mind is part survival. And, um, you know, you're being told as to how you need to exert authority and gain respect in the community. So at some point, you must be getting pushed to do more and more. It's like, oh, you only slapped her, you know? Mm. So what was the first thing for you was the first violent act that you're like, oh, I remember doing this. I think that that was the moment when I was recruited into the gang. So yeah. we had a lot of street gangs in, in our community. And then there was this gang that I got involved in. And as I got into this gang, I, I needed to get a knife because everybody had a knife. Yeah. And so they said, you know what, because you're part of this gang, we're giving you a knife. And so they gave me this knife called the sable. You know, because there was three kinds of knives. And mm. as how you progressed in the gang, you would get a different knife yeah. um, um, representing your anniversary. So the first knife that I started on was the, was the sable, you know, the small one that you could actually peel a, an apple with. Yes. And, and being told that you have to go and now you have to go and rob someone, physically use this knife. Um, if the person doesn't want to give you what they have, you would literally have to stab them. So are you saying the expectation was not to use it to threaten someone or get them afraid? As long as you've robbed, it doesn't matter. The expectation was you have to draw some kind of blood. Because that, if, if you could draw blood as, as, your, as, as in your entry in the yeah. gangs, it would, be, it, would be, it would show more uh, loyalty, it would show yeah. more... Um, how can I say? Obedience. Obedience, yes. in a way. So that was the, the part of it. So there you are, they've given you your knife and you are now being initiated. What does that like whole process look like? Are they saying tonight's the night we're doing it or tomorrow we expect you to come to tell us what happened? So this was not the initiation. This was just getting with the guys, just walking with them, sitting with them, you know, just being in their presence. I I thought it was (laughs) No, it was just... Uh, and, and there it was like, if they stop and they want to rob someone, um, you join, you know, and they will push you to say you take the lead. And uh, the only robbing that I've seen in my life was on TV, you know. So I would, I would you know, when they, the first time they pushed me into this, yeah. it was this old lady walking with two bags. Yes. Um, she was coming from the shops. And her assumption was that I was coming towards her to help, to help her, her with the bags. But instead I was like, give me what you have, you know? And, and I said like, where's your money? You know? And she was like, what are you doing? You don't do this, please. I don't have money. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I remember when my grandmother used to put her money, yeah. you know, I was like, you must have money. You can't just yeah. be, you know? And so it was that moment where I was this old lady who was a representative, a representative of, of my grandmother yeah. you know and it was difficult because I, I literally had to be somebody else I literally had to turn myself off from saying I'm going to rob an old woman who could have been my grandmother so and, what happened and as I was pushing her she fell yeah and the plastic bags went and I ripped her she had this overall on yeah. and I took this little um, wallet that she had and I just ran you know, um, didn't look back whether she was hurt, whether she was okay. I just looked forward and I was just like, we need to run, you know. So at, while this is happening, are you being watched to check that you are doing what you have been told to do? So the guys were there, you yeah. know, um, walking a bit faster than me, saying we'll get you as you come. But they were laughing. They were like, you know, congratulating me for my first hit. You know, it was like, wow, we didn't think you would do it, but yo, you surprised us, yo, you know, it's awesome, you know, being patted on the back, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, and when I was walking with these guys, I felt a sense of belonging. I felt a sense that I actually made it, and for me, it felt good, you know, but part of me wasn't happy. So did you actually 
get the knife in her? Did you actually stab her or you just pushed her and ran? I think for me at that moment, I had the knife, but I never stabbed her with the knife. Yeah. I just pushed her. And I think that was also done intentionally yeah. because I was more afraid that if she would lean into me, yeah. then I would have to use the knife. But pushing her away was much more getting her away from yeah. the knife than anything else. But my mind was still telling me, I wonder, she, I hope she didn't get, you know, hurt, yeah. you know, because she was fragile. And yeah. Is there a, a sense of adrenaline that hits you after you do something that scary, that powerful? I think for me, it was just the concept of, I really want this. I really want to belong. I really want these guys to accept me. You know, and there's a part of me where, you know, your, your, there's like a, you know, your, your heart palpates, you know, it's yeah. that fast pacing. But at the same time, you know that you need to do this yeah. because it's important. Yeah. Um, this old lady is not going to be there. Yeah. You know, you're going to be here. You're going to be left with these guys. Yeah. And that's going to be the people that are going to ultimately say whether you're in or out. Yes. And that was important. Okay, so what was the next level? I mean, you say that that was just basically hanging out with the guys. When, when did it become, we are formally inviting you to join us? This is what inviting you means. And if you don't join us, this is what it means. I think for me, the, the most important part was when we started doing house robberies, yeah. you know, and jumping over the fence, you know, chasing you know, the dogs chasing us, mm. us poisoning the dogs and yeah. taking the TV. And those times it was like those big as TVs, you know, that, yeah. that big behind. So it was quite heavy to carry. Um, and, and it was constantly doing that, mm. that I felt like, you know, it's actually tiring to do this the whole time. Mm. And then I remember that the, the big guy, the boss was coming to town mm. and he was just visiting and he stopped um, and he said, you know, I, I see potential in you. He looked at me and he said that he saw potential in me. And when he said that, I could clearly remember that not once did my father ever say that he sees mm -hmm. potential in me. Mm -hmm. And that minute when that guy said that, it, it made me feel like, wow, I, I finally got to where I wanted to be. Like you're special for something. Yeah, I yeah. felt like because there were so many boys around me, but he looked at me, yeah. he spoke to me. And when he said that, he said, I want to see you later. So come yeah. to the Purple House. And I went to the Purple House. And as I sat there, he said to me, I need you to do things for me. You know, I need you to, you know, deliver some parcels and stuff like that. Mm. But, you know, keep on your uniform. Don't take your uniform yeah. off. Um, you know, take the books out of your school bag and mm. just come over. And, and, you know, I'll give you stuff that you need to deliver. And that was my new job. Wow. You know, all of a sudden I was out of the streets. Yeah. And I was in this guy's confidence. What age was this? I was, that time I was 14. That's like early yeah, high school. Yeah, I was 14 years old. I was, I was, um, it was, it was at that moment when I really felt special. Mm. You know, he used to give me addresses, go and deliver this. Yeah, I never looked. He never, he said to me, don't ever look in what is inside. Just, you know, just drop them off. What did you think was inside? It was quite light, you know, it was quite light packages. So I could think it was probably drugs. Yeah. You know, um, that time it was predominantly marijuana yes. and mandrax. Yes. Um, we didn't have crystal meth and, and cocaine at that time. Mm. And I felt that was just basically what he wanted me to drop because most yeah. of these houses that I went to drop these things off were, were dealers, yes. you know, people that were dealing. Um, there was this one day where he handed me this big bag, mm. um, backpack, and it was quite heavy. And he said to me, take this home and put it under the bed. I remember my grandmother still asking me, what bag is that? Yes. And I was like, no, ma, don't worry about it. You know, it's yeah. nothing. It's just a friend who gave me a school bag. Mm. You know, he's going to come and pick it up later. And I went into my room and I put it under the bed. But you know that thing where curiosity gets the better yeah. of you? And I was like, I wonder what it is because it wasn't the same weight as yeah. anything else that I've ever carried. Mm. And as I took the bag from underneath the bed, I looked and, and I saw all of these firearms. Mm. It was the first time in my life that I've actually seen a firearm. Yeah. I've seen it on TV but never really saw it in real life. Yeah, which is a completely different experience. Which was a completely different yeah. experience. But I remember when I took one of these guns and I held it in my hand, immediately I felt a sense of power. Yeah. I felt like the room that I was in, I was dominating. It was like I was an authority 
you know, this room was small, yeah, you yeah. know, and, and I went to the mirror and I played with it. I said a few things. I was, you know, I was just, I felt that sense of power. And yeah. at that moment, I wanted to know what it would be like to really have this power. So now when you have a gun in your hand, is there any part of you understanding what the purpose of that firearm is? Is there any part of you which is fantasizing about killing someone? I think for me at that moment, I, I didn't really think that far, yeah. but I just thought of dominating, yeah. you know, coming into a room where everybody else has knives yes. and I have a gun. Yes. You know, I even looked at my knife and said, like, comparing these two. It's nothing. Uh, it's yeah. nothing, you know, and, and for me, it was like everybody would be afraid of me. Yeah. It would be, how would I instill fear in, in so many people by using this one tool? Mm. Um, and at that moment, it became my rush. And that is why when I met him the next day, I said to him, you know what? I don't want to be on the streets. Yeah. I want to know what it's like to be part of the real gang. So you, in essence, are the one who said, please give me an opportunity to, to do more because there was this enticing moment that made you feel a certain way, which you're like, you want to be in the action. Fast forward for me to the moment where now um, you are about to or going to commit this particular crime and... I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this is the moment of the actual initiation. Mm. Yes. Because you won't really be accepted if you don't follow through by taking someone's life. Yeah. So it was at that moment when he laughed when I made that suggestion. Mm. Um, but he said, but are you ready? Yeah. Are you, are you, are you cut for this? Yeah. Um, he said to me that your life is going to change because he was more of a mentor. Yes. He never wanted me to leave school. He never wanted me to do drugs. This he is so really... contradictory. I'm so confused. And m mind you, I do understand that he wasn't operating on the day to day with you and the peers. Mm. But you have the authority figure who is, you know, even overseeing the, the ones you look up to, not wanting you to neglect this part of your life. So why was it still so enticing if you got that so-called approval and that your special mention that you were looking for? I think for me, I felt that he saw more in me than anybody else. What is more? I think that I, I've always done a lot of things in my life to, yeah. to make my father happy. Yeah. I remember bringing back a report um, and it was all A's. Yeah. Like, it was all A's. Yeah. And I said to my dad, look, I, I, I passed. And yeah. my father looked at me and said, it wasn't good enough. Yeah. And I was like, but dad, I can't do more. You know, yeah. I, 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 I literally can't, you know. Yeah. And um, it was like, he was like, it wasn't important. Yeah. And I said to him that this is the best that I could do. Yeah. And here was this guy who never judged me. Yeah. He never looked at me and said that I couldn't do more. He, he always pushed me to my yeah. limits, you know, and, and if I couldn't, be best at what I needed to do. He would always say to me, don't be too hard on yourself. And um, he wasn't even my father. Yeah. And, and that was the relationship that I had with this guy. And I, would, I, I was prepared to do anything yeah. for him. If I understand you correctly, it's almost like even though this man that you admire um, is giving you that approval, it still was not your dad. Mm -hmm. It still wasn't your father, if I understand you correctly. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I, I can totally relate to feelings of not feeling good enough. And I can't imagine that level, that extent, that um, in that type of environment. But I know that it's stuff that we can carry with us for four years. So speaking about the man who you say was your mentor, I mean... In hindsight, and what you're sharing with me now, do you think he was asking you, are you sure you want to do this? Because he was testing to see if you're gonna say yes, or he was asking you, are you sure you want to do this? Because he genuinely did not want you to do that. I think when, when I looked at how he used to handle things, he, yeah. was, a, he was a very brutal and ruthless man. Um, and he wanted things to be done his way. And if things weren't done his way, he would be ruthless. 
um, when he asked me, is this what I want? I somehow connected with him in that way of, yeah. he was really genuinely concerned, you know, mm -hmm. but at the same time he said, if this is what you want, I'm going to do this. Yeah. And as he introduced me to the rest of his crew, and that day they gave me my first firearm. Yeah. You know, it was a, I can remember it was a snub nose 38 and they gave me my bullets. And these men said that if he does this, he would be everything that you said he is, which I didn't know what they meant by that. Mm. And, and what did they mean by that? I didn't, I didn't know at that moment as I was sitting yeah. there. And um, obviously I couldn't use a firearm. I didn't yeah. know how to shoot. So they had to train me. Um, so they were teaching me, they were showing me, were taking me to, you know, a, it wasn't a range like mm. a normal shooting range, but it was just a forest. Yeah deep down where you could just shoot and he would stack the bottles. He would come and look yeah. at how I was doing. Yeah, the guy that was training me would say, no, he's getting there. And he would constantly look in on how I was doing this. Yeah. And I remember that night when I got my assignment, um, it was on a Thursday mm -hmm. because I remember that my grandmother asked me to go to church with her on the Friday because it was going to be umlaliso, mm -hmm. like that vigil on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, I'll be prepared to do that. And he said, listen, this is a very complicated hit. Um, if you do it the right way, you would really have these men's respect. Mm. Um, and he didn't give me a lot of details. Um, so the guy that went with me said, the house is in Cape Town, mm. in one of the suburbs. Um, the alarm um, wouldn't be on, so it would be okay. Mm. Jumped the fence, got into the house, mm. and it was clear cut shooting, just get to the guy, he's in the bedroom, go in there and just shoot. Mm. Um, and, and there was no instruction to take anything, it was just literally It was just go, it. this is the man, hit yeah. him. Were you allowed to ask why? Or it was just, that's an... At that moment I felt like, I, I, there was a lot of questions I wanted to ask, yeah. but I was like, it's not my place. Yeah. I asked for this. Yeah. So because I asked, it would be... Yeah. You know, it wouldn't be fair to ask why, yes. you know. So as I went there and jumped over the fence, got into the house, the front door was locked, went around, the back door was open, went up the stairs and I opened up this room and I saw that there was pink and stuff on the walls mm. and I realized that this was a children's room. Mm. So there was two kids in the, in the house and... Um, in my mind, I thought that it was just going to be this guy. Yeah. Um, as I went into, closed the door, went to the next room, and this was the guy, and his wife was next to him. Mm. And thinking about it, I had a 38 snub nose. Mm. If I shoot him, it would go off loudly. Yeah. The wife would wake up. Yeah. So it was a, I didn't know what to do. Um, and they never told you what to do. They just said, go and get this done. And as I looked at this guy, I put the gun against his head. While he's sleeping. While he was sleeping. Mm. And he woke up. And I said, just please be quiet. You know, I don't want to do this in front of your wife. I don't want to do this in front of your kids. So please get up quietly and come with me. And this guy looked at me and he said, you don't want to do this. Mm. Do you know who I am? And I was like, I don't know who you are and I don't care. Mm. And for me walking with him downstairs and I said, let's just go outside. And as we went outside, I could see the pool and I asked him to go on his knees and I stood behind him and I shot him twice. And I jumped over the wall and I got into the car and we drove away. And that moment when I did that, a part of me wanted to help. Part of me wanted to be the better me. Mm. I wanted to know why this man had to die. He was, looked like a good guy. He had a family, had two kids. He looked like a good guy. Why did I do that? But a part of me also said, if I don't do this, I would not be welcomed back into my own community. These men would never respect me because before I left, he said, if you do this, these men will respect you. Yeah. And as we got back to the house and I gave my gun, I said, I did it. 
these men were like so happy. They were like, give the man what he wants. Do you want something to drink? Do you want something to eat? You know, it was, they were all happy. They were all glad about what I did. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was sad. I was really, really sad. I want you to take me back to, um, I mean, you were prepared to pull the trigger with him in bed, but he woke up and saw you. Was that not even a second of, is this a sign I shouldn't be doing this? Was that even a moment of hesitation for you? My worst fear that I sometimes think about is what would have happened if the wife had woken up? Is it because you knew you would have, have, to have had to kill her too? I think that judging from where I was coming from, yeah. there would not be, they would be loose ends. Yeah. You know, they, would, they wouldn't be, I mean, I got eight bullets for a reason, for a purpose. So I feel that in a way, was I prepared enough to do that? I don't yeah. know. Would I be able to go into the kids' rooms and, and shoot the kids? Yeah. I don't know. Um, the fact that he woke up and said to me, don't do this, mm. but willingly walking down with me, willingly going into the backyard with me, going on his knees and not fighting, I think he knew that if he would had made a noise, if he had made anything, his family would have been... Can I challenge your choice of word of willing? Because I can tell you now, if somebody had a gun to my head, I would do anything they would tell me. So would you still consider that willing or is that completely under duress? I think the reason why I'm saying willing is because after I had shot him and sitting in that car with my mentor, I asked him, why did this guy have to die? Only to discover that he was running half of a community that I was coming from, Bonteville, Carlson Fontaine. Mm-hmm. He was the biggest drug pusher mm. and he was living in a suburb. He had a wife, he had kids. Mm. He was living it up, but yet he was controlling half mm. of the community where I was coming from. So for me, I didn't feel at that moment guilty that I had taken his life because he was killing people himself. So. Were you under any substances when you did it? I was never allowed to use any merchandise, as he would call it, any drugs or anything like that. He always wanted me to be sober-minded when I did something. So at that moment when I did that, I wasn't under any substances. I was completely sober. Okay, so now you are saying that he explained that the reason um, his life had to be taken is because he's running half of these hoods and living it up in the suburbs. How different is that to what he was doing? Because it's not like he was saying rob people to give back to people. I think that, that, I think that for me, the, the, the whole brainwashing in the gangs for me at his hands was the fact that he was saying that if you do this kind of work, rather be known to people that you're doing it. He used to joke with me and he used to say that he, he feels much better if a guy comes into his house with a gun and robs him mm. than a guy dressed in a suit that tells him to invest money, takes wow. the money of his father, takes the money of his mother, goes into a fancy office yeah. and disappears two or three weeks later after taking half of their pension. Yeah. He says he has no respect for men that live like that. Yeah. Because they always think that they are smarter than us that are living on the street. That they are better. That they are better. Yeah. He says, look at me, welcome. I come into my community because this is a community that I've built with my hands. Yeah. I walk here, I sleep here, I eat here, and I provide for the people in my community. Kids that don't go to school, I pay for their school fees. Yeah. Mothers that don't have jobs, I pay, I give them money. I, I, I'm the modern day Robin Hood, he would say. Mm-hmm. And he says, this guy stays in a suburb kills half of our kids, turf wars are rendered because of him, and he lives in isolation from the nonsense and the Mm. shit that he causes. He lives away from the community he's robbing, as opposed to being a part of a system, but also being a part of the the system, if I'm making sense. Yeah, it does. And for me, that, that is what he, that is how he wanted me to understand the justification. Yeah. A part of me didn't feel okay with that, because I still felt 
very much plagued by the fact of having taken this life and knowing that these kids are going to grow up without a father, you know. Um, but for me, a part of me said that maybe he deserved it. It was just the mind telling me, trying to justify the action. Mm. And that's basically all that I could think about. You um, had that conversation for yourself to justify the act at that time. Do you think he deserved to die? At that moment, yes. Um, but later on, no. Um, I think for me, it, it, it was a bit of a difficult pill to swallow because after that act, um, he even said to me that you're going to get better as you do more of these. What does get better mean? As in you're going to care less? If you, if, you, if you continue to take life, you're going to start, it's going to start normalizing. Mm. It's going to become okay. You're going to, not even going to think of your first hit, he mm. said. And, and to a certain extent, he was right. You know, the more there were gang uh, violence erupting all over the Western Cape and going, and going out and shooting other gangs mm. and other gang members, it, it, it literally became normal. Mm. It literally mm. became like, you know, they want to kill us, we kill them first. Yeah. They want to do this, we do it first. Yeah. So it was more of that kind of justification that if I'm not going to do it, they're going to do it. If I don't shoot, they're going to shoot me. So it was more of that I need to do this in order for me to survive. And part of me started normalizing that. Part of me started making excuses. How old were you when that first incident took place? I was 16. So you were still a, a child? I was still, yeah, very much. At, and I was still at school because, yeah. as I said, uh, the sun, the, it happened on a Thursday evening. Mm. Uh, the Friday morning I went to school as if nothing wow. happened. Um, I, I left school, went back home, got into clothes, went with my grandmother to church, you know, and... Tell me about that night, though, because you have now everybody affirming you, you're getting a pat on the shoulder, you're getting a drink, you're getting rewarded, and um, I'm sure on some psychological level you're riding some kind of high from what you've done and what's happening around you. But the moment, and I always ask myself this question, the moment you are alone and you're with yourself, like what, is that, what is that moment? For me, it, 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 it's, it's true what you say. Is like there was that kind of high of, yeah. of, of like, you know what, everybody now all of a sudden, their respect have changed completely. Yeah. I mean, everybody in the community now sees me. But also there's just outside of people seeing you and saying, oh, we respect him, we're afraid of him. <clears throat> Many people who have taken life say there is a high, there's a power. I mean, for, for life to be birthed and created is such a process. For a person to be able to take it in a second, that is power. Exactly. It doesn't mean it's good power, but it's, it's some kind of power that gives you a certain high. I, 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 I hear what you're saying. Because there was, you know, at that age, for me, there was a lot of noise going on. Mm. You know, noise from my parents, my grandmother, um, my friends, my recent... Uh, found a new life mm. in the gangs, you know, and being in there. Mm. There was such a lot of noise that that point of sitting down on my own was not, was not really happening for me. Mm. It only happened when we went out on the Tuesday evening mm. and we had to do this hit in Durbanville mm. and we were seven in the car. And what happened was that as we entered into this community, um, I don't know how, but it felt like you know, there was this other car following us. Um, as we were getting out to do our thing, the police were on the scene mm. and we were all arrested, mm. you know, and me at that moment being arrested and I had the firearm mm. that I had used because it was mine. Mm. Um, I think for me, it started when I stood in front of the judge and he sentenced me. And when I went into solitary confinement on my own in prison, mm. no other people around me, a complete dark cell. Mm. That is where I started thinking about yeah. my life. Whether the decisions that I have taken that brought me to this point right now, mm. were they worth it? You know, I, 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 it makes sense because I'm sure there are a lot of distractions, like it's human nature to try and avoid feelings that are not great. Mm. 
it's you avoid that discomfort of having to like really sit with something that feels heavy. Um, I, I'm just, you know, when you're telling me that the, the police were suddenly there, you were being followed, you had the gun, were you set up by your own people? I don't think it was a setup. I think that it we were, as the as the as the the uh, investigator shared with me, um, this detective that was investigating the case. He said that you were driving in a conspicuous vehicle. Mm. You were too many men in the car. You were driving into a suburb. Mm. Like, bra, it was like, if you had gone in there on your own, it would have been. You know, it would have been different. much more. But yeah. on that time, white people were always on the edge. Yes. You know, especially when it was more than you know a few black people together, it was already yes. like, what's going on? Yes. You know, and already alerts went out. And the police was there in, in, in like, you know, in a jiffy, mm. which means it wasn't really a setup. I think for me, when I was in the police van and these men that were with me, we started to negotiate, saying, welcome, because you're the youngest. Mm. You are not going to get a heavy prison sentence. You might not even get a sentence. All you do is that when you get in front of the judge, tell the judge that you don't know us, mm. that we gave you a lift, and if you say that, we'll take care of your family, we'll take care of you, and whatever you need, your family will be well taken mm. care of. And stupid and naive as I was, tried calling uh, this guy that was my mentor. He didn't answer his this phone. This is now when you're in jail. That was in prison. After they promised you the moon and the stars, and they got off scot free And they got off scot free Everybody went home, and I stood there, and I was given 23 years in prison. And at what age are you at this point? I was 17. So, I, I mean, and maybe this is, you know, a completely different conversation with regards to the criminal justice system. How is it that a 17-year-old gets 23 years? Because, uh, or, or maybe, you know, things changed in terms of the legal system and how children are treated, but that almost sounds like the sentence of an adult. I think for me, it was, it was in my month of having my birthday, I yes. was going to turn 18. Yes. So they could say it like that. But at the same time, I also think that the gravity of the yeah. case at that moment, um, and, and also that the, that the investigating officer had said to the judge that it was what welcome does. You know, it's, he, I mean, my street name was Dynamite, and yeah. I wasn't even called welcome anymore. So a lot of things changed for me with, yeah. from the time when I was 12, joining the gangs, yes. until I got to the age of being arrested at 17. So w within that time, I did a lot of nonsense, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and I built up a rep, you know. So being arrested after so many years on the streets mm. and doing my thing was, was, was an achievement for the police. Yeah. And like I said, going into prison at that age, everything changed for me. You know, um, I, the guy never... I called, he never answered his phone. Um, I tried reaching out, he never spoke to me. It was just dead. And does that include everybody else that was in the game? Everybody they else just shut was you in, out. Everybody just shut out, nobody wanted to talk. Um, people just didn't want to say anything to me. I didn't know where I was. I was literally on my own. And I came to realize that I was on my own the minute I got into population, when you go into prison, you get put into solitary confinement. Now I had to be put into a room where there's many more other offenders. Mm. And I remember stepping into that room and this guy asking me who I am and me telling him that I'm welcome and him slapping me in my face. Mm. I literally came to understand that no matter how much credit I had on the streets, it means nothing. It meant it. nothing in prison. So just so I understand clearly, that life that you took prior was the only life you had taken at that point. At that, at that specific point, mm -hmm. um, when I was arrested, I was arrested for many things. As I said, extortion, kidnapping, mm. um, attempted murder and all that. It was the shooting of other gang members. Yes. Um, whether they died, we don't you know. Don't because know. when you shoot a guy on the street and he's a gangster, the first code of the street is that you don't go to a doctor. Yeah. Because when you go to the doctor and they yes, remove the police, they remove the bullet, the police must be notified, yes. the police must come, they must take ballistics. Yes. All of that, so it's a so they'll go to a back house doctor that's going to remove the bullet. So you don't know, and if the guy died, they would just dump his body at the beach or bury him somewhere in the forest. Yeah. So I I wouldn't know. There wouldn't be an exact count. Yeah. But all I know is that yes, those processes happened. Yeah. My eight bullets weren't just eight bullets. They were much more than eight bullets because yeah. I had to be refilled. So now, what happens? What does Gran say when she hears why you're arrested? It was funny because she was the only one that really supported me.
that, that continued being there for me, that came to prison, after prison, after prison. But in prison. the moment where she gets the news that this is why you're arrested, it's one thing to know your kid is part of gangs for, you know, you might think, oh, it could just be drugs, it could just be, you know, robbing people. But it's a different thing when they say he has been arrested for this particular Nobody crime. believed it. Yeah. The, some of the people in the community at school, they didn't want to believe it. Yeah. You know, my principal was like, welcome, this is not you. What happened? Yeah. It can't be you. Do they have the right person? It was nobody wanted to believe it. My grandmother even said to the investigating officer, you've got the wrong boy. Yeah. It's not my grandchild. It can't be him. Did you go and confess to her? Um, I had to tell her I didn't have a choice. Um, because for me, seeing her the way she was and mm. even saying that if it is that you need to get your lawyer, we'll get you the mm. best one, I'll have to go, and even if I have to borrow money, i like, no, I don't want that mm. to happen. In the back of my head, I thought that I would get the best lawyer because these yeah. guys promised. But when I went to court, you were alone. I was alone. And then the judge asked me, what's going to happen? Yeah. I said, you know what, I'll rather take a state lawyer. So now you finally, the noise is dead gone, you are finally alone with yourself. And it's not like you were completely removed from what religion or talking to a God is about. When was that first moment where you're like, I took someone, like you actually processed that you took someone's life? I think for me, it was, it was everything in prison had to happen all over again. So As in, you starting from scratch. Being I had the to start from scratch old, and being initiated into oh. something else. And when I joined the prison numbers gang, it was just another journey of its own, and that's a conversation for another day. Why do day. you say it had to start from scratch? Was because it again the same thing of if I don't join, I, I don't would have not protection. be safe. Yes, I would not be safe in prison. For me, I men were being raped. Men were being killed. Things were happening. I was in the midst of all of that. I mean, imagine being locked in a room with 80 other men from all walks of life. You know, being as young as I was, um, old men coming up to you, touching your legs and promising you bread with peanut butter and jam and promising you smokes and promising you this. And, and obviously, when you do take these things, knowing that at 12 o'clock tonight, he's going to want his bread back, knowing that you don't have it, so you would have to give him something else. What, you know, what is the worst thing that happened to you in prison? I think for me, the worst thing was being beaten up, mm -hmm. um, being kicked. Um, and, and it wasn't just one guy, like being kicked by numerous of men because they didn't see me as subservient. They didn't see me as... They, they, the guy just looked at me, asked me a question, I answered him. And, and I added on to what he was asking because I was still smart. Yeah. And he didn't like the fact that I was smart. He didn't like the fact that you talk I, too much. I spoke to him the yeah. way I did. He, he asked me, do you think I'm dumb? Yeah. And I said, well, you asked a dumb question. Yeah. And it was just like the France sinifomani. In prison, it means this, you know, this mampara doesn't see me. He thinks he's mm -hmm. speaking to a 14, you know, somebody that's nothing. And this guy was a gang member. He was in the numbers and he just asked the guys and he's like, and they started kicking me and beating me up. And for me, that was the last time mm -hmm. when I was at, in the, in, at, at, the, at the nurse's office. Um, I, I said to myself in my head, I would never be kicked like that in prison ever again. I'm going to do something to change this for myself. So you changing that situation for yourself meant you going through a similar process as you did outside. Now you are being initiated into a new gang because it's going to provide you protection and other things that um, would make your life more comfortable. Then. Exactly. So did you have to take another life in prison? So while I was in prison, when you want to climb the numbers rank, you have to stab a correctional officer. Okay. And I was already versed with the knife, so it wasn't something difficult and complicated. And the guy that was guiding me said that that would be the fastest way for you to get recognition in here. Mm. Only by taking blood in prison are you recognized as being powerful enough to do whatever. And if it's the blood of a correctional services officer, it's a lot. It's a lot more. Yeah. You could stab another prisoner. It wouldn't really make a difference because yeah. they get stabbed all the time. And um, there was this one correctional officer who used to come to me all the time. He used to bring me milk. He used to bring mm. me extra sugar. I was a people's person. I used to talk mm. a lot. I was very smart. Mm. Um, I had, you could have a healthy conversation with me. I was the chairperson yeah. of the debating council, remember? Yeah. So I could have that conversation and he liked me. So he would come to me and ask me, 
do you have enough bread? Do you need more mm. sugar? Do you need? And the guys in the room saw that. They saw this guy coming and bringing me sugar, bringing me this. And I remember that day when they gave me my knife to say, that, listen, you're going to be trained. Eight mm. days, you're going to have to stab this correctional officer. So they wanted that specific they, one. And they chose, they said, in the courtyard tomorrow morning, you're not going to know who you're going to stab, but we'll show you the guy and you're going to go and you're going to stab him. And as I walked onto the courtyard and this correctional officer was coming towards me, they said, this is the guy that you must stab. Mm. So you can imagine, he was open, his arms was open because he thought I was going to give him a hug, you know, and I stabbed him in the neck. And as he was laying there bleeding, as I said, another part of me wanted to help because I knew this guy. Was somebody standing behind you? There was two guys making sure that I do it. If I didn't do it, they would stab me. Yeah. You know, and so I did it. And I went to solitary confinement for 30 days. And because it was prison, they took the knife, these two guys that were with me. They couldn't charge me for that guy's murder. That's how it worked in prison. So he did die? He did die. And how did that make you feel, taking the life of somebody who had... I mean, he doesn't... That's not his job. Mm. It's not his job to be nice to you or to bring you milk and to check if you need bread. It's not his job. And the day that he's opening his arms out to you, you betray him. I think the, the code on the street has always been don't trust anyone because at the end of the day you might have to kill them or they might have to kill you. So it was just how it was. That is so scary. Like I've heard people say don't trust anyone because they might have to, they might betray you and your feelings might get hurt. But you are saying don't trust anyone because you might have to kill them. And I'm actually just thinking, you see how your story, all the people who reached out to you, like the granny who's like, oh, he's going to help me, is the one that you attack, the one who is saying, don't do this, this is not who you are, is the one that you attack, the one who opens their arms out to you, is the one that you attack. Is that some form of, I don't want to say a sign, but do you think that that is... Are you being told something about yourself? I think for me, what I've learned in my life is that vulnerability and fear. If a person comes to you vulnerable, the fear that resonates in you can easily take that person. If the person expresses vulnerability, if the person expresses that emotion of opening up to you, and you knowing who you are, it's easier to kill or hurt someone that's, that shows vulnerability. Um, we're not going to use anybody's names, you mm. know, in our conversation, because this is more about your own experience. You've now, you acknowledge what you've done, you've served your time. Um, let's start with the correctional services officer and, you know, the other man that you were told who he was and what he was doing, when, like, at what point in your journey did you now have to go through that process of asking for forgiveness, which you don't have to do. Mm. Um, it was a point that you reached on your own. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm having so many confusions because you had to stay in the gang to survive, but at the same time you're trying to do internal work to better yourself. How does that all work for you to get to a point where now you're saying, please forgive me, I'm sorry I took this man's life? You know, I, I used to joke about this when I was doing my self-work, is that people, they sometimes think that they're all good. People walk around with that notion that I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Um, a guy comes home, catches his wife in bed with another man. He's a police officer or he might have a gun in the house and he just shoots both of them. How does it justify a man that grew up in a church, that had a grandmother, that had a parents, that had a good life because of what had happened and what broke him at that moment made him a different man? Um, in all of us is a darkness that at some point we need to confront. I learned that instead of me battling and fighting with my darkness, I sat down and had a conversation with it. I said, brah, how do we live together? How do we coexist? Because you're always going to be in me. So if I understand you correctly, and, and I get what you're saying, is that everybody could find themselves in a situation where they might have to take a life. to do things that they might not ordinarily do. 
in the case of yourself, you've gone through the process, you've come out, you are trying to better yourself, you're doing work, mentoring young, young men. <sighs> Do you think you would find yourself in a position where you could take a life again? If the circumstances were, yeah, were, were facilitating that? I think for me, and I've said this on many platforms, that I have a daughter who I love a lot. You know, um, for me, family right now is very, very important. You know, my partner is important. My daughter is important. The people closest to me are very, very important. And I would do anything, anything to make sure that it stays like that. Um, and friends that are in the gangs know me. It's like, you know what? Um, it's not that we are all ticking time bombs. Um, like you said, if the circumstances were different, would I do it again? Yeah. As I say that, it, it all depends on the circumstances, but I do think that I'm a much better man right now mm. because what I do is that I take every conversation and every confrontation to my head first, mm. and then I take it down to my heart and ask myself, does this person deserve what's going to happen next? Mm. Could, there, could I have spoken to him differently? Could I have spoken to her differently? Could I have done things differently? Road rage, for instance. Mm. If a guy cuts me off while I'm driving, could I just have taken 10 seconds of just breathing in and breathing out? There's exercises that I do before I go into the most severe parts of who I am. Because like I said, that darkness will always be inside of me. It's always inside of all of us. It's how do we deal with that? Um, so to your question, would I do it again? I don't know. You know, it's so weird. This, yo, this conversation is so triggering. Um, I, th I think of people that I have loved who've, whose lives have been taken. And the only thing I see is the pain that I felt or the pain that my loved ones felt. And listening to you talk, I think the reason I'm like getting so emotional is because like I'm seeing your pain and I never ever thought that I would experience that, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. Because I think about loved ones whose lives have been taken. And I think that's the most important thing as to why we're having this conversation. Is that some of these situations are not plain and simple. They're not black and white. And there's in no way I condone what you did, but I hear what your story is. And, mm, and it's so heavy. I just think about the people who that's the life they live every day. I mean, I have an uncle who was murdered. Thank you. I've heard my grandmother even tell me stories of her brother being murdered. It's so painful. So I think I want to understand how do you sit with that? How do you sit with that? And I know it's not you who did this to me, but I want to understand. I think for me, what I've come to learn is that in order for us to truly appreciate life, we need to understand and feel death. Because many people out there don't appreciate what they have. They're not grateful for the life they've been given until at that last moment when they're going to lose it, that they finally realize the importance of it. We see a society that is so infatuated with cell phones, the latest this, the latest that, having everything, having a family, you know, going out there partying and just showing people how beautiful life is. But that's the, that's the problem. That's not the beauty of life. The beauty of life for me suddenly became real when I had a conversation with death, where I was in that position where I had 
I had to rule whether this person is going to live or die. I was the decider. I was the one that had the gun in my hand, the knife in my hand, and I was going to end this person's life. That is when it became real for me. What about my life am I really grateful for? Because we all think we have time. And I was taught on the streets that you don't have time. Time is not yours. You could die tomorrow, you could die tonight, you could die later. It's not yours, so don't treat it as if you can do it tomorrow. Yeah. That is why I always say to people, when you love someone, love that person completely and wholeheartedly. Spend time with people that are more closest to you, more, because anything can happen. There's another old welcome being made out there. There's another gang being groomed out there who might cross your paths one day, and until you really realize the importance of life, you will open the door to death. And for me, that's been my lesson, is how do I deal with what I've done? And the only way that I've dealt with it was that I, I had to learn to forgive myself first. And how did you do that? And I'm, I'm, I'm asking it in a very practical, honest way. There are people who are watching, who are sitting with the demons that genuinely want to know how do you forgive yourself. But there are also people who are watching, who are thinking, how do you even begin to forgive yourself if there are people who might never forgive the thing that you did? I get that, and, and for me, I've made peace with that. The reason why I'm saying that the, the, the part that I had to play in my own life to forgive myself was to first understand the gravity of my crime or the gravity of my act or what I did um, was to understand that not every guy that you rob that has an iPhone X <laughs> is rich. Yeah. You know, it's like this guy might have had taken this thing out on a contract. Yeah. He might have gotten it as a gift. You know, um, it many, might not even be his. It might not even be his. The, 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 the thing for me was I had to come to the terms of realizing that people pretend. That was the first thing. People pretend to be who they are not and they die in that pretense. So I had to cancel out all of that first to realize that when taking a person's life is to, is to really understand whether this person deserves that. And when I'm going to do this, am I aware of the consequences of what I'm going to do? So you even saying deserve that, are there people you believe deserve to die? I think that everybody deserves an opportunity to, li to life, to live. Um, there's just people on this earth that just don't care about other people's lives. Um, when I was in the streets, you know, the gang bosses that I used to work for, I mean, their kids were far removed from our communities. They were at Model C school, for God's sake. You know, these kids were driven to school every single day. Um, they were spoon-fed with silver spoons. They were given the best life that can be. They were taken to the waterfront, they would sit at Santon, they would enjoy their lives. While the very father that's a father to them is killing other kids that deserve the same privileges as his kids have. I don't know how a man like that can look at his family, close his eyes, and not think about that 14-year-old girl that is being raped because these guys are under the influence of his drugs, or that little boy that's being beaten up by the father right now because of his drugs, or because of his merchandise, as they call it. So for me, sometimes I think that people like that, they're a cancer to society, but I only had to understand it after I was part of that, that I was also a cancer to society, and I needed to do my self-work to realize how do I become a cure to myself, and that was where the forgiveness for me came in powerfully. I, I, I hear you. I think it's a lot to digest, and I'm definitely not in a position to judge anything, not knowing the shoes you were in. Um, but I think I have a better understanding. Even having read your stories is nowhere near enough to, you know, being able to sit with you and, t and talk about it. And it makes me sad because it's almost like in all those stories, everybody's a victim. Nobody's lose. Nobody wins. Even the one who's pulling the trigger also doesn't win. But what I can say 
in, repro in retrospect to what we were talking about, when I started doing my forgiveness work, understanding that restorative justice was my most important tool, it's actually a program that I did while I was in prison. When I came out of prison and having the courage to go back to the family that I had taken the father from, where we spoke about the correctional yeah. officer. So because they grew up in the terrain, in the area, all correctional officers stay in their own community. Mm. They could no longer stay there because the father was killed and they had to move. So the kids could, could no longer go to the Model C school because the father was no longer there to provide. So I left prison and I knocked on the door because I asked around where they might live. And I knew that he had a, a son and a daughter. And I knocked on the door and the lady opened up and she looked at me and she says, I was expecting you to come. And I didn't understand what she meant by that. And as I sat down, she said to me, you know, when you killed my husband, he went to work and I knew that he one day would not come back because that's the kind of work that he was doing. Prison, guarding offenders is not easy. It's, 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 a, you know, it's like the police. I don't know whether my husband is going to come back. And when they said to me that he died in prison, um, I was bitter, I was angry, I was resentful. Um, I had to leave my life behind. I had to raise my son in Lavender Hill, where you can see it's a gang-infested community. My daughter, who's currently in grade 12, is finding it difficult to live in this environment. I don't know what to do. And when we started talking and we started having that kind of conversation of what I can do moving forward is that family became like my family. The girl works for us today. She's one of our coordinators in Cape Town. Um, the son is, is currently doing his matric. And um, that was the power of forgiveness from a mother that I had taken a husband away from her. Um, forgiveness is an important thing. People might not understand. She has always been ridiculed to say, how could you forgive this guy that killed your husband? And her question or answer to them has always been, why not? Why not? Because I'm looking out for her son. I'm looking out for her daughter. And when I speak to her daughter and her daughter looks at me, I sometimes ask her, do you realize that I'm the man that took your father's life? And she says, welcome, I know you did. But I'm also looking at the man that is giving so many lives back again. For the one that you've taken, there's a thousand you've given back. I judge you according to that. And I think it will bring it back to right at the top of the show when I said, you know, it was important that I called this, I took a life and not, you know, sitting with a killer or a murderer because I wouldn't want you to be judged just on one act. Even though the impact is massive, I think there's always more to the story. Mm. Is there something you would like to share with viewers that um, they may not know or something that you think they should know, something you'd like to share? I think for me, the most important message I want to give is as fathers, as mothers, parents, you know, to be available, you know, for your child, to be present, to be there to walk that journey with them. Um, we've got so many parents out there that when the kids say, I'm going to my friend, mothers don't even know who the friend is. It's just to be more available as a parent, to know your child's friends. Um, many other parents that know that they haven't bought their child a cell phone to ask, where did you get it? You know, it is so easy for boys and girls out there to just slip into the gangs um, without them even knowing. Child comes home with a pair of Nikes that you didn't buy. Mm. I always, I want to encourage parents to ask, where did you get it? Mm. Who bought it for you? Because if you, if I didn't buy it for you, where did you get it? Um, and, and another message is to people out there as well, live with values. You know, in course I, I say that mm. you've forgotten who you are. And if you are a nation that forgets who you are, you will die a nation that has no identity. And it will be the very people 
that are living next door to you, opposite to you, that would be the, you know, that will cause your demise, that will cause your end. Stop pretending. Yeah. You know, stop pretending to be who you are not. Rather, be in a space where you know who you are, because when you know who you are, you have power over life. You have power over death because you live with values and those values, they guide you, they sustain you, they encourage you, they, they bring you to a point of Ubuntu, yeah. that I am who I am because of somebody else. Yeah. And I remember when I was on the streets and we used to go out and kill and shoot and do all of these things, is that these men that we killed didn't have their real names. One was called Scarface, the other one was called Brookies. They didn't have their real names. It is when I realized that my name is Welcome, I understood my identity. Because when we know each other by name, it is so much difficult to take a person's life because it becomes personal. And I want people to become more personal with each other. People are too, it's his world, it's my world, he's black, he's white, he's colored, he's yeah. Indian. They push each other off and let's get together. I think I can't add anything more to what you've said except to say thank you for sharing and for participating in my own personal healing, which I did not expect in this conversation, but I hope that your story really opens the minds of people who have other perspectives, of people who need to forgive themselves, of people who need to be forgiven, of people who need to forgive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. There's nothing more I can say. That's it. Thank you for joining us. Next time on Unpacked. This is my body. My, you all understand? So if I talk about your Tsubinki, yes, I'm talking about it because it's an agonna. I know. I'm experiencing all this. I can go on stage and wear very tight pants, but then I'm, I'm going to, there's 100% I'm going to pay the price for that on stage. Comedy belongs to, and it's an abject space. It's a space of the people who are not supposed to have a voice. Why am I confusing myself? Only women of color think that I'm the thin one. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs>